We're going to move along here and, and, and present this, this procedure and this device. And I think those, those are very good questions that, that were asked. Um, and I think that uh, the clinical evidence, I think, is going to guide us. But I think the speakers have spoken well about what the potential um, advantages are of controlling the access, which is important. Uh, if I can get control of my slides here. Oh, I think we forwarded there a bit. Um, so what I'm going to speak a bit about is the actual design of this device. I think it's a very intriguing device. I remember when, when Michelle, uh, the CEO, came to me and presented this material. I was, I was very impressed. I, I had had a lot of experience in the super auxiliary space. And for me, the issues were not really hypotony, actually, believe it or not. I was more concerned about how does the body react to intervention in this space? Because the body wants to heal. And I think the work that has been done came out of University of Washington, which is basically this geometrically designed implant. You can see with the design, the surface design, the pores and the throats, uh, and this tissue material, this medical grade silicone with this design has been found to be antifibrotic. In fact, um, the studies that were done at University of Washington were actually quite consistent in terms of uh, the ability to control the way that the body heals. And I think the secret sauce to any of these procedures is going to be to address wound healing, uh, number one, first and foremost. And how do we do that? Well, of course, we can use chemicals like mitomycin C, but ideally we want to stay away from those things because we know the potential risk. So both by material, geometry, design, flexibility, all these things will play a role. You can see the implant here. You can see it's about five and a half millimeters in size. And you can see how the arrangements of these hollow spheres uh, around and through the implant essentially promote biointegration. What we want to do with these procedures are is basically to kind of almost trick the body to basically feel like it's your own part of your own tissue. And when the body feels it's basically, you know, uh, not a foreign body significantly, of course, the tissue reaction encapsulation reduces. These, these pores and, the, and these spheres, basically microspheres, and pores allow for natural drainage to occur. Uh, remember, there's a, there's a negative pressure gradient through the space, uh, and this biointegration doesn't inhibit this from occurring. Think of it like a sponge, basically allowing the flow to continuously occur. And it's very different than, for example, what we see for lumen designs, which have a set lumen size where fluid drains through it. This is a very novel way to think about it, uh, a very controlled outflow procedure. Uh, as I said earlier, uh, the uh, evidence around biocompatibility is really critical, and there's various ways to look at this. Of course, these are in rabbit eyes, for example, some of these some of these slides, and histopath, rabbits tend to fibrose quite significantly. And you can see over a six month a six month period, uh, the very nice tolerability, and the way that the uh, space heals around the implant here. Uh, you can see well tolerated. You can see again that the minimal amount of inflammatory cells. And, you know, you can see that there's basically these fluid spaces that essentially allow for fluid to drain through and lower pressure. And so those are, those are some of the advantages, again, with this material, uh, which I think is a secret uh, part of the procedure itself. So let's just play a video here. Mm -hmm. This is just showing the delivery system. Of course, material can be great. Implant can be designed really well, but of course, it has to be delivered properly. You can see that it's, this implant comes in a flexible sheet. Implant is 5 millimeters by 1 millimeter in size. Notice how flexible and soft it is. This is important when we think about safety as well and about the ability to, for, the, for the device to securely fit within the space. You can see the multi-channels and the matrix of pores that are present here, uh, looking at the microscopic view of it. And notice this green ring. This green ring is important because this green ring is what we use to guide implantation to ensure that the implant is placed adequately in the anterior chamber. Uh, we want to make sure that the implant only remains in the anterior chamber for 0.5 millimeters. And by lining up that green ring as it's delivered, it allows it to be properly placed. You can see the shaft is what we use to deliver. The roller wheel retracts uh, in this ergonomic design, and basically we then place the implant adequately in. Like, like anything else, of course, uh, we do need to uh, have a proper gonioscopic view. A small corneal incision is made, uh, and this can be done standalone. Um, again, just a video just to show how we basically place this, this, this flexible uh, sheath present in the anterior chamber. We use the carefully designed bevel, and believe me, we, we, we have this, we've done the procedures, and this procedure is fairly intuitive to do, as you can see. Um, and once the, once the shaft is placed adequately, the green ring is lined up, as you see there, uh, at the level of the spiral spur, as you see in the, in the drawing here. And then, basically, the sheath is retracted, allowing the, us to lay the implant and release the implant within that space. Uh, and again, the aqueous then immediately flows through, and this is where the implant is is designed to be placed. Uh, and let's just go to the surgical video here again, just to show 
Uh, what we're basically showing here is the, uh, is the delivery system that's present here. Uh, the roller wheel that we use is designed to, once we place the device in the space adequately, we line up the green room, we can retract it. Notice the flexible seats are designed here with a, with a curve to allow us to access the space. Um, we can place this again through a clear corneal incision adequately. And a gonial lens, of course, is, is necessary uh, for these procedures, as we do for all mixed procedures. Visualization is really important to make sure you can see how nicely we can visualize the implant within the distal end of that sheet. Notice the uh, visible green ring, which is an important, again, landmark to use for adequate placement. Here we'll show some surgical footage. Uh, this is some of our procedures that we've done uh, as part of our trials, and we'll be hearing again from Philippe and Julian with our results. So like, like we've done with other procedures, we use the bevel to access the supraciliary space by gently pushing just posterior to the scleral spur. This disinserts uh, the ciliary body in the area of implantation, and then we gradually push the sheath forward, again, in a forward motion as we access the space. Once we have placed this further forward, we, notice, we note the green ring. We line, as you see, the green ring is lined up to the spur, and then we can retract the sheath with the roller wheel placing the implant, again, leaving it where it should be present, you see, in the angle. And you see how little is present in the anterior chamber angle. It's a very small amount. Again, it's soft, so it conforms to the eye. It's not a rigid implant. And that conformation is very important because it follows a natural curvature of the sclera, avoids it from coming up anteriorly up toward the anterior chamber or, or the cornea. And you can see here that the uh, positioning has, has, been ad has been adequately confirmed, as you see in that presence as well. So just to summarize again with this procedure here, just a couple of things to remember. This is basically a, a supraciliary mixed procedure. It's a next generation procedure uh, as we move forward in this in the space. Uh, it's a blood free procedure, which I think is an advantage, of course, if we if we can lower pressure enough, of course, and we'll hear about that as well. The star material is what I think is what's important to consider here. Theoretically, certainly, and we'll see clinically on this one, but theoretically, we see the benefit both in terms of the uh, physical science and the clinical science in terms of the material, the way it's designed, the way that the, um, the pores are made, and the biocompatibility of this material is important. It's not very inflammatory in nature. Uh, again, it appears to be well tolerated in animals. Uh, and uh, we see that uh, our clinical work, as we're going to be seeing, we now uh, will present our results. So before we get to that, I did want to um, have a chance to take some questions. And again, I appreciate those of you that have, uh, have answered or asked these questions, and I'll I'll throw them also out to the uh, to the group as well, um, and again, please feel free to write them in, in, in the bottom of the uh, of the page there of your of your web page. Um, so let's let's basically go to some questions here, and again, I'll I'll have uh, I'll have uh, Paul, Julian, and Philippe also throw in their thoughts as well. Um, there's some questions about there's been some other materials that have been used in the supraciliary space, uh, for example, polyamide, um, and do you feel this material? Uh, will be less likely to cause supraciliary scarring uh, that has been seen with other material. And again, the example that was given here was, was more rigid polyamide. So maybe some differences with that, what we've seen with polyamide. Anybody want to throw out their thoughts on the difference in material and how it's tolerated in the space? From animal studies, uh, it has been shown that this material is very uh, biocompatible. And I think... Uh, uh, the interest of this uh, material is to to inhibit fab fibroblast proliferation and to uh, uh, to reduce the risk of uh, encapsulation uh, around around the implant. So I think it, is, it seems to be a, a good natural into brackets technique to open the uh, the supraspirary space very smoothly in a smoothly uh, uh, smoothly uh, technique. And uh, you say that the, the, the implant is flexible. And I think it's a, a big advantage because if you put something which is very hard to the sclera, you may induce some uh, anatomic, anatomical changes. With this flexible and very smooth uh, mix, I think it's better for the physiology. Yeah, I, I agree. I think besides the material itself, I think the design of the micro pores is also a benefit. Uh, you know, when you, when you look at studies on even tubes, when you have adequate or significant flow right away, you, you will induce more fibroblastic laydown. And so having these micro 
pores for a slow diffuse uh, ingress of fluid or aqueous into that space has a potential for less encapsulation, as you mentioned earlier. So I think it's the soft material, the bio biocompatible material with those micro pores that prevents that significant encapsulation. And you're absolutely right with the hardened material, the polyamide, you know, even people rubbing the eyes, there's a ten chance that it keeps hitting against the endothelium. So having that marker and a soft material with those micro pores, I think is really what's getting giving us that safety with the decreased risk of fibroblastic uh, proliferation. I think you said it, I think you both said it very well. And I think there's so many different ways to think about tolerability and safety and efficacy. They kind of related in some ways, material, the design, the rigidity or softness, of course, are all important The geometry of it, all play a role in terms of how well it's tolerated. The hydrostatic forces that emerge from the implant and how well they're diffused in the space all of these, as we see in any space, we're draining into in the body, but again, also the supercellular space are important. So I think we, you know, this design of this implant has, has been uh, in a, done such a way to optimize, I think, outflow without some of the potential risks uh, in other options as well. So that's kind of what what uh, what what the idea is here. Uh, there's been a question here someone asked, and then we'll move forward. Just uh, early studies uh, suggest increased outflow with thinner and younger scleras and less outflow with thicker and older scleras. Does this factor into patient selection? So I don't know if anybody wants to take that take that comment, is that this, does the sclera characteristics, thickness, rigidity, age, uh, play a role in, in the ability for these procedures to work in outflow? So I, I, I can I can make, make a few comments. So first of all, I think that there's a lot, lot to think about when it comes to uh, sclera and the role of uvascular outflow. We know when we think about the uvascular outflow pathway that the uvascular plexus and the, and the sclera all play a role. Uh, the uvascular outflow is probably not as well defined as we, we, we may think it is in terms of where it ends up going, number one. Uh, number two, I would say that, um, you know, I think that uh, we don't really have any, I don't think we have any clear evidence that one makes a difference or the other. There's so many different variables, including, of course, uh, infl inflammation and, and immunological factors. And number three, I think that the variability in thickness generally speaking is, is is not really that large of course we we're not doing these procedures in nanothalmic eyes and really thick scleras mind you to really compare them we probably wouldn't so i think for average eyes i think it's not i don't think it's a major consideration from what we know thus far from what i have seen i don't know paul if you want to add a comment and then we can move to our next topic yeah and just an interesting uh, uh comment where, where when the sidecast was around we were actually starting doing some studies using coronal hysteresis and seeing if that had a relationship with, you know, potential for, let's say, hypotony, you know, very, very, uh, let's say, low hysteresis, more rigid eyes that have the non-ability to absorb and disperse energy, would that have a higher risk of, of hypotony? We had some correlations that we were looking at. So I think, interestingly, going forward, that would be a nice thought to look at hysteresis as a surrogate for the ability to absorb and disperse the energy in relation to these devices. Yeah, that, that, is, that is a valid point, actually. You're right, especially the, the myopic eye, perhaps more so in that, in that, in that situation here, as you mentioned. So... I think that uh, there's, there's certainly a lot more work we need to do to kind of understand that more. But for the most range, most of the range of the patients that we've been seeing, I think they're fairly, fairly consistent on average. And we try to be careful, of course, working in extremes, whether they're really small eyes or very long eyes, we would just say we should be mindful of that. 